In this video, I'll discuss fundamental analysis and why it's so important when we perform broader security analysis. Then I'll briefly describe the ratios that you should have covered in Finance 300, but are commonly used in ratio analysis. And then I'll introduce peer group and time trend analysis, and we'll wrap up with me comparing Tesla and Ford, and then I might have one more example for you. Let's get started. When we talk about fundamental analysis, what we're talking about is the study of financial affairs of a business for the purpose of understanding the company that issued the common stock. In other words, we want to understand what factors affect the value of that stock. There's a number of characteristics or factors that we care about. First, we care about the competitive position of the firm. We want to know where it relates to other firms in its industry. Next, we want to know the types of assets that this firm owns, and we also want to know how rapidly this firm is growing its sales revenue. We also want to know how profitable this firm is. We want to know whether or not the firm is able to remain profitable through recessionary periods, and whether that profit is volatile or not. Next, we want to know how liquid the assets of the firm are. We want to know, can this firm cover any immediate expenses it might have? Can it cover any current liabilities? And then finally, we also want to know the capital structure of this firm. So what is the weight of debt versus equity on the firm's balance sheet? All right, now let's talk about the financial statements that we really focus on in fundamental analysis. First, we have the balance sheet. The balance sheet is the statement of what a company owns and what it owes at any one specific point in time. That's a little different from the income statement, as we all know, and the income statement just provides a summary of the operating results of the firm over a period of time, like a quarter or a year. The final statement we tend to focus on with fundamental analysis is the statement of cash flows, which is going to provide us the summary of the firm's cash flow over a particular period. All right, now I need to go into ratio analysis. And this is where it gets a little tricky because you should, by rights, remember almost every single ratio that I'm about to talk about, but let's face it, it's probably been about a semester. So I'm going to give you a very, very quick overview of the ratios that we tend to focus on in ratio analysis and talk about why they're important and how much more important some ratios are than others. Now the reason ratios are important is because they allow us to do one of two things. First, we can compare a firm's ratios from one year to the next. And second, we can compare one firm's ratios to those of a direct competitor in the same industry. This first type of analysis is called time trend analysis. The second type of analysis is called peer group analysis. Let's get started. So the first type of ratios you should remember are liquidity ratios. And these are ratios that tell us how likely it is for the firm to be able to meet its day-to-day -day operating expenses and satisfy short-term obligations. Now there are really three liquidity ratios that we talk about most frequently. The first is the current ratio. And this is one of those very few ratios where we have some hurdle that indicates a good firm versus a bad firm. So the current ratio is just current assets on the balance sheet divided by current liabilities on the balance sheet. And we generally want this number to be greater than one, but we don't want it to be too high. The reason we don't want this thing to be like, oh, 20 or 30 is because what that means is this firm is holding far too large of a portion of its assets in current assets versus investing those assets in some productive uh, assets. So we generally want a current ratio between one and some small integer. The next ratio we have is the quick ratio. And the quick ratio is very similar to the current ratio. The only difference here is that we're dropping off inventory in the numerator. So the reason we use the quick ratio is because some firms might not be able to sell their inventory quickly and we need to take into account that inventory is the least liquid of all of the current assets. So the quick ratio, or as it's sometimes known, the acid test ratio, gives us that ability. 
It's just current assets minus inventory on the balance sheet divided by current liabilities. The next type of ratios we have are activity ratios or efficiency ratios. And these tell us how efficient the firm is at using some line item. So how efficient is a firm at using its capital? How efficient is it at using its assets? Uh, let's start off with the most basic of these activity or efficiency ratios, the account receivable turnover ratio. So the accounts receivable turnover tells us how, how quickly the firm turns over its accounts receivable. We want this number to be very, very high because what this means is that this firm doesn't have a lot of assets and accounts receivable. It's regularly getting paid in cash. And so it's, it's clearing its accounts receivable. A higher number is better in this case. Another metric we can use with respect to efficiency ratios is the inventory turnover measure. And this measure, as the name implies, tells us how quickly the firm turns over its inventory. All we're doing is just taking sales revenue off of the income statement, dividing that by inventory, and that'll give us the speed with which the firm is turning over its inventory. We want this number to be as high as possible. The third efficiency ratio that I need to give you is arguably the most important because we can calculate it for every single firm regardless of that fir whether that firm has inventory or not. And that's the total asset turnover ratio. And the total asset turnover ratio tells us how efficiently a firm is using its total assets to drive sales revenue. So we're just taking sales revenue divided by total assets uh, so obviously this is on the income statement, this is on the balance sheet. This will tell us how efficient a firm is using $1 of its total assets. Most firms are going to have total asset turnover somewhere above 1 but below about 5. And obviously we want this number to be as high as possible. This ratio more than anything is our best measure of firm efficiency. The next set of ratios we have are leverage ratios. And these ratios tell us the amount of debt being used to support our operations. And we sometimes refer to these as solvency ratios, but essentially they're, they're telling us how able a firm is to remain solvent and how much leverage the firm has. The most basic of these you've undoubtedly remembered from your finance 300 class, and that's the debt to equity ratio. And we would just calculate that using the long-term debt of the firm on the firm's balance sheet divided by shareholder or stockholder's equity. Now, I, I should point out that, well, two points. First, different analysts will use different measures in the numerator here to calculate total debt. Some people will use total debt. Some people, some people will actually use total liabilities. And... Regardless of what metric you're using in the numerator, the higher this is, the more leverage the firm has taken on. And the more levered the firm is, the more likely it is to default on its debt. So these, the higher the debt to equity ratio, the less secure the firm is in the case of a recession that is unforeseen. Uh, we would also say that firms with high debt to equity ratios are typically less solvent. Now we do have two other leverage ratios here. The first is the equity multiplier. And this is just total assets off of the balance sheet divided by shareholders equity on the balance sheet as well. And this will be used when we start to talk about the DuPont formula, but I'll save this for later. The third leverage ratio that I'll mention here is the tie ratio or the times interest earned ratio. And this is probably the best example of what's called a coverage ratio. It measures the ability of the firm to cover its fixed interest payments. So the tie ratio is right here. It's just the earnings before interest and taxes off of the income statement divided by the interest expense on the income statement. And the interest expense is the amount of interest the firm is paying to its bondholders and EBIT is profit before interest and taxes. 
So we want this thing to be as high as possible because that means our firm is able to meet its debt requirements. And in other words, service its debt. Uh, so typically a ratio or a tie ratio of eight or nine is pretty good. A uh, big red flag would be if we saw a tie ratio of less than about three. Uh, that would indicate that the firm is highly unlikely to be able to meet its interest expense if there is a recession that comes out of nowhere or COVID strikes again or something like that. So we want to be very cautious and we always want to identify what the tie ratio is for our firm. Next we have profitability ratios and profitability ratios are exactly what you'd expect. The first ratio we have is the net profit margin, and this is going to tell us the rate of profit being earned from sales revenue. Uh, in other words, uh, our bottom line divided by sales revenue. So net income or net profit after taxes divided by sales revenue. Next, we calculate return on assets, and that's just net income or net profit after taxes divided by total assets. And then finally, we have return on equity or ROE. So ROE is just the return on the firm's shareholder equity. It's just net profit after taxes divided by the shareholders equity. And this is going to tell us our return on that equity. Now if a firm has no debt then its ROA and its ROE are going to be equal. However if the firm does have debt what that's going to do is increase the denominator of the ROA and so our ROA is actually going to be smaller than our ROE. And that leads me to the DuPont equation. So the DuPont equation is an older formula that was developed about in the 1950s by individuals at the DuPont Corporation. And what it does is it allows us to decompose return on equity. So our return on equity is just net income divided by shareholders' equity. However, what we can do is break that down into three of the ratios I've already talked about. Net profit margin times total asset turnover times the equity multiplier. And so what we have here is net income divided by sales times sales divided by total assets times total assets divided by shareholders' equity. And sales will cancel and total assets will cancel and so that's how we're left with net income divided by shareholders equity. Now the benefit of the DuPont equation is that if we have identified that our ROE of the firm we're analyzing is lower than that of another firm in the same industry, this decomposition allows us to see exactly what factors are driving the ROE of our firm. Is it firm profitability that is suffering or is it firm efficiency? Well, it might also be the total leverage of the firm. That's why we use these three formulas. I mean, this first one is just the profit margin, the second one is total asset turnover, and this one is the equity multiplier. So the DuPont equation allows us to decompose ROE and see how our firm stacks up across several different ratio types. Now the next type of ratios we have are valuation ratios. And valuation ratios tell us, as an investor, exactly how valuable this firm is. The first ratio, and likely the most well known, is the price to earnings ratio, or PE ratio. And this is essentially the price on the market divided by earnings per share. Now we have two forms of the PE ratio. We have the forward PE ratio and the trailing PE ratio. And the forward PE ratio, again, it's the market price per share listed on the stock exchange divided by earnings per share. But with the forward PE ratio, we're using expected earnings per share or forecasted earnings per share. The trailing PE ratio uses historical earnings per share over the past 12 months. Usually it's going to be easier to calculate trailing PE ratios because it's going to be easier to get that EPS over the past 12 months rather than estimating the future EPS. Now another point I should make here is that if we see an NA or a blank for the PE ratio, what that's going to indicate, and you'll see this 
in the real world is that the firm currently has negative earnings per share. We never report a negative P.E. ratio, I mean, especially a, a trailing P.E. ratio. Now, the reason we focus on the P.E. ratio is because the P.E. ratio is a pretty good measure of expected earnings growth. And let me show you what I mean by this. So I'm over on Yahoo Finance, and I want to take a look at a company that I'm pretty sure will have a very high P.E. ratio. So let's try Netflix. And as we can see, Netflix's P.E. ratio is 82.44. That is very high. Generally, the average P.E. ratio on the S&P 500 will be between about 16 and 25. So a P.E. ratio of 82.44 is far higher than the average P.E. ratio of a firm on the S&P 500. This very high P.E. ratio means that investors are willing to pay $82.44 for $1 of historical earnings per share on Netflix. In other words, the higher the P.E. ratio, the more valuable or the, the higher the earnings per share growth rate is expected to be for a particular firm. Now let's take a look at another firm. So here is Ford Motor Company. Notice here that their P.E. ratio is N.A. What this tells us is that the firm has had negative earnings per share over the past 12 months. So anytime we see negative earnings per share, we just leave this blank or put an N.A. Let's try one more example. Let's try, we'll say Walmart. Here we go. They have had they have a PE ratio of 25. That's pretty consistent with the market as a whole, and that tells us that investors are willing to pay about $25.21 for every dollar of current current or historical earnings per share. And then if you want to get the price per share, you just take the PE ratio and multiply that by earnings per share. All right, now let's talk about another ratio the price to earnings growth ratio, or as it's more commonly known, the PEG ratio. Now, this ratio compares the PE ratio of a firm in the numerator to the growth rate in earnings in the denominator. Now, the benefit of the PEG ratio is it tells us, or it gives us a sense of how overvalued this firm might be. If the PE ratio is greater than the three to five year growth rate in earnings, what that tells us is that this PEG ratio will be greater than one. And when that occurs, this firm is likely fully valued or it might even be overvalued. Uh, if the PEG ratio is less than one, then what that tells us is that they're seeing a more rapid growth rate in earnings than the PE ratio might reflect. And so typically when we see a PEG ratio of less than one, we say that this stock might be undervalued. I have to be honest with you, I don't think I've ever used the PEG ratio in any of my own personal analysis. I, I don't think there's a lot of value in the PEG ratio, but it's one of those that you should have at least heard of. Uh, so that's why I'm mentioning it. The next ratio we have in terms of valuation is the market to book ratio. And you should be fairly familiar with this already. It's just the market price per share of stock on the exchange divided by the book price per share. And so this is also sometimes referred to as price to book. Now, most firms that are not in significant financial distress will have a market to book ratio of greater than one. I mean, I've mentioned in an earlier video that the average market to book ratio is, oh, somewhere between 1.6 and 3 in any given time period. Uh, but in certain markets, especially bull markets and markets where there's a uh, stock like Tesla or Netflix where their book value per share is very low, you can certainly find stocks with a, a market to book ratio well in excess of four or five. All right, let's talk about another ratio that we can sometimes use, and that is the price to cash flow ratio. And this is just our market capitalization of the firm, so total market cap of the firm, divided by operating cash flow 
This one is less well known. I mean, everybody knows it, but it's less well used. However, in my own valuation work, I've tended to find that this is one of the best or most accurate metrics in the market multiples process, which we'll talk about in a later video. This ratio is very important, and uh, it's one of those that y you might find that you use rather than, say, the market to book ratio or the peg ratio. The final ratio I'll discuss is the price to sales ratio, and this is just market cap divided by total sales. And price to sales ratio, you'll see it around like two, three, four, maybe for, for a lot of firms. Uh, the higher this is, obviously the more highly valued the firm is. Uh, this ratio is going to be very important to us when we get to valuation work because, well, quite frankly, this ratio doesn't require a firm to have positive earnings per share or positive cash flow per share or a positive book value per share. Sales revenue is almost always going to be greater than zero. I mean, I guess you could have zero sales, but I, I, I mean... Why? <laughs> so the price to sales ratio is very beneficial for us when we are comparing two de novo firms or firms that are relatively young uh, with one another and probably don't have a or probably haven't turned a profit yet. All right, now let's talk about another formula that you should know. And before I get into our final valuation ratio, I need to introduce enterprise value. Enterprise value is the market value of the firm as a whole. It represents the market value of the equity plus the market value of the debt minus the cash of the firm. And the reason this is so important is because if you are trying to acquire a firm, the enterprise value is essentially the, the market price of the total firm. Now, notice here that I said market cap plus market value of the, the debt minus the cash. However, in the formula, I have the book value of the debt minus the cash. The reason I have book value here instead of market value is because for most firms, the book value is going to be very approximately similar to the, the market value. Uh, unless the firm is severely financially distressed, book value is, is going to be very close to market value. So we just go ahead and sub in the, the book value for most firms when we're calculating the enterprise value. Market cap here is just total market price times shares outstanding, and book value is just the value of all liabilities on the balance sheet, and cash is just cash on the balance sheet. So if you ever want to calculate the total market value of a firm, this is how you do it. So the reason I mentioned the enterprise value is because we use it in our final valuation ratio, the EBITDA ratio. And the EBITDA ratio is a ratio that divides our enterprise value, so the total value of the firm, by the firm's EBITDA, or earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. And this EBITDA ratio does more or less the same thing that the price-to-sales ratio, the market-to-book ratio, and the P.E. ratio do. It tells us how valuable this firm is relative to some level of, in this case, profit, or something very close to profit, or earnings, I guess we could say. So let's try an example with the valuation ratios. Ford's market share price is $16, the book value of equity is $6, the firm had earnings of $7.1 billion in 2013, the firm has 4 billion shares outstanding. What are the earnings per share, P.E. ratio, and market to book ratio? Well, let's start out with earnings per share. Earnings per share is just net income divided by shares outstanding, and we're given that we have $7.1 billion in earnings this year, divided by 4 billion shares outstanding, so our EPS is 1.775. Next, we're looking for our P.E. ratio, and the price per share, that's just the market price per share, divided by EPS, which we just calculated, and that's going to be $16 divided by $1.775 per share, and that gives us a P.E. ratio of 9.01. And then finally, to get our market to book ratio, we're just going to take the market price per share 
divided by book price per share. And that'll give us 16 divided by 6, or 2.67. So there we go. It's as simple as that when calculating some of these ratios. All right, let's try calculating the payout ratios. We've talked about both of these, so I'll just be very brief. The first is the payout ratio, and that's just dividends divided by earnings per share. Uh, what this is going to tell us is how much of the cash generated in a given period gets distributed out to shareholders. Historically, payout ratios have been between 30 to 50% for dividend-paying firms, but growth-oriented firms like Netflix or Tesla or, I mean, any other rapidly growing firm is probably not going to be paying a dividend, so it's going to have a zero payout ratio. And if you do see a high payout ratio, that generally means that the firm is not growing as fast because it's providing all of its earnings per share in a given quarter to shareholders. The second payout ratio we have is the dividend payout ratio. And this is just dividends per share divided by number of shares outstanding. And this just tells you what the total payoff is for investors on in, an, in any given year. All right, so the big question is, how do we use these ratios? And I, I started this ratio section by mentioning how we use those. We use them by analyzing historical trends, aka using time trend analysis, and we can also use these ratios and compare them with their direct competitors ratios, aka peer group analysis. There is a third way that we can use these ratios, and that is with respect to common size financial statements. And common size financial statements allow us to compare firms' line items with one another or those line items with their historical line items. And what we're going to do here is we're going to scale all the balance sheet line items by total assets and all of the income statement line items by sales revenue. And this will essentially give us another way to compare firms with one another. All right, now let's take a look at some of these ratios and how we can use them in time trend analysis. So I've downloaded some data from Bloomberg on the profitability of Ford and the liquidity of Ford over the past several fiscal years, so going back to 2009. Let's start with the profitability of Ford. So up here near the top, we have the ROE of the company and the ROA. So from this, we can see that over the years, Ford's ROE has tended to fluctuate pretty wildly, but they've always been fairly profitable since fiscal year 2012. The firm also had ROA that was a lot lower. Well, the fact that ROA is so much lower than, common, than ROE tells us immediately that Ford has borrowed a large amount of money. I mean, that's the only way that this could really happen. Uh, they've, they've borrowed, and ROA is the number scaled by total assets, whereas ROE is scaled by total equity. So ROA is a lot lower. As we go down here, we can also see the profit margin. That's going to be right here. And as you can see, the profit margin is still positive, which is a very good thing. It's kind of shocking. Now, if we go down here to liquidity, we can see that Ford is relatively liquid. I mean, ever since 2015, the firm has done a good job of maintaining a current ratio of greater than one, which is really what we want. And we don't want it to be too high because that means we're not out, we're not investing in new capital budgeting projects. So 1.2, that's a pretty good current ratio. Uh, quick ratio, again, pretty close to one. That's all right. Remember, that drops off inventory. And then we have the cash ratio. And this is the third liquidity ratio that I didn't mention. This is just cash divided by current liabilities. And it gives us another way to analyze the firm's liquidity. It, but if you have these other two, this third one really doesn't say too much. But what we can tell from these liquidity ratios is that Ford's liquidity significantly improved starting in about 2015 or fiscal year 2015 as compared to the period since the financial crisis in 2009. 
We can also get a sense of Ford's leverage ratios. So their total debt to equity has been extremely high over the past several years. That is fairly uncommon. I mean, a lot of firms that are not financial firms will have a lower debt, uh, debt to equity ratio than this. And then we can see a number of other statistics like the debt to total assets ratio. And obviously what this tells us is that the firm has, in terms of uh, capital, about 60% of that, the book value of that capital is in the form of debt versus equity. There are other measures we have here. One of them is Altman's Z-score. This is an indicator of firm distress. Generally, we, we want this thing to be above 1.81 uh, based on Altman's original model. Uh, anything less is indicating uh, some financial distress, uh, but that original model was developed in the 60s, so it's questionable how, how good that is. All right. Let's take a look at Tesla's ratios. So Tesla is a little different than Ford. It has never had a positive ROA or positive ROE, or at least at the time of this last f set of financial statements. Its net income margin is, or profit margin, is also negative through time. Uh, I mean, I would argue that the firm's profitability is slowly improving, although it, it's volatile from quarter to quarter. So who can say, based on this information, uh, the firm is or has been in some years fairly liquid, but in other years, uh, we can say that Ford is relatively, or sorry, Tesla is relatively less liquid than we would like it to be, especially when we take a look at the acid test ratio. In terms of total debt to equity, notice here that Tesla is relatively less indebted than Ford was. One of the explanations for this is that Tesla is very risky. I mean, it's a relatively younger firm. Ford's been around for about 100 years. Tesla, for a long time, there have been concerns that the firm would actually have to default on its debt. So it's a lot harder for a firm like that to borrow at a good interest rate, a low interest rate. And so rather than issuing a lot of debt, Tesla has tended to issue a lot more equity. All right, now let me show you how we get some common size financial statements. So to get those, what I'll do is I'll use the, actually we'll just start off by looking at uh, Tesla. Tesla, and we will go to their financial analysis section in Bloomberg. And here we can, let's try looking at the firm's balance sheet. And notice here that we have the firm's balance sheet for several years. I mean, we can go all the way back to tr fiscal year 2010. But to get their common size balance sheet, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on common size, and what this is going to do is divide every line item, every number here, by total assets. Uh, so total assets will be down here at the, well, halfway to the bottom. So right here, in the most recent uh, complete year we have, 34,309,000,000 is our, going to be our denominator, and so when I click common size, what you can see is that now every line item is represented as a percentage of total assets, whereas before it was just the, the actual value in millions of dollars per share. So the benefit here is that we can compare the amount or the, the ratio of each line item to total assets through time. So for example, using common size financial statements, we can see that Tesla became a lot more liquid in 2019 relative to 2017 and 2018. And if we go over to the income statement, we can do the same thing. We can scale all of the firm's line items by total sales revenue. So total sales revenue in the last 12 months ending in 6-30-2020 
was about 25 points uh, well about 25.7 billion and as you can see the cost of goods sold was about 80.2 percent so for every dollar of revenue 80 cents of that went into producing whatever goods uh, made up that revenue our gross profit has increased from the last year to this year and we can see that the pre-tax income which has been historically negative is now starting to turn positive if we go down here to net income as you can see our, our net income as a percentage of total revenue aka our profit margin is now positive whereas in the past it was negative which is good for us all right now i do have one final example for you with respect to ratio analysis so i pulled this data a couple of years back but i love showing this example because it shows exactly what you can get by just looking at ratios so here i have four firms firms a b c and d and i have their short-term solvency or liquidity ratios long-term solvency their leverage ratios profitability and market value ratios and we can see that for some of these firms some of these ratios are much higher than the others so for example all of these firms as of the time that i pulled this data had very low liquidity i mean on average the industry average here is well below one for the the current ratio not good notice here that these firms don't have any inventory either since their current ratio is the same as their quick rush ratio their debt to equity ratios are off the charts i mean 12 11 10 29 you don't ever see that with very few exceptions in the real world down here with the profit margin firm d is more profitable uh, firm a is the least profitable and then firm d is also the most highly valued based on every metric we have whereas firm a is actually the least valuable based on the pe ratio and it's the second least valuable based on the EBITDA ratio you might be wondering what these firms are and when this data was taken the answer is that these firms are investment banks and i took this data as of the end of the second quarter of 2008 the last full quarter prior to the financial crisis so our best bank here is arguably charles schwab the worst bank here is lehman brothers and notice here their debt to equity ratio this is a i mean this leverage is off the charts i mean what this says is that for every dollar of shareholders equity on the balance sheet the firm had borrowed 29 or 30 dollars in debt prior to the financial crisis i mean that is not sustainable that is a recipe for disaster and in the end in september of 2008 lehman did end up filing for bankruptcy uh, so that's that that's a good example that i have for the importance of ratios all right let's go ahead and recap what we covered first fundamental analysis is the study of the financial affairs of a business for the purposes of understanding the company that issued the common stock in other words we use fundamental analysis to understand a specific firm and its security its stock we use a variety of ratios in fundamental analysis efficiency ratios liquidity leverage ratios profitability payout valuation all of these are going to say something slightly different and it always helps when you are looking at at least two measures of each ratio type because one ratio might give you some information that only shows up in that ratio whereas if you're using let's say two or three measures of liquidity you get a broader set of information with respect to a firm's liquidity we use ratio analysis in a couple of different ways we use that analysis to compare firms to themselves historically in time trend analysis and we also use ratio analysis to compare firms to their direct competitors in what's called peer group analysis
The final point I want to make is that we can calculate common size financial statements that essentially allow us to perform ratio analysis as well. And common size financial statements occur when we divide all of the line items on the balance sheet by total assets and all of the line items on the income statement by total sales revenue. And with that, I will wrap up and I'll see you on the next video.